Good evening and welcome to The Widdershins Yarn. My name is Stevie and I'll be your guide as we wander off the beaten track and into the queer, crooked corners of the mind. This podcast is an exploration into the folklore, aesthetics and social psychological impact of the horror genre. Why as a society are we so lured by what lies in dark stories? Why do we want to tell horror stories and why does being afraid give us a sense of thrill? How do stories told through different mediums both channel and exercise our collective societal fears? Uh, I'm so happy that tonight I'm joined by my guest host, Lilius. Lilius is... <laughs> it's you! <laughs> Lilius is the fabulous designer, Cage Crinoline, the formidable drag queen, Charlotte Chark, and one of my favourite humans ever. Lilius, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Also, I loved your intro. That's the first time I've ever heard it, and I was like, ooh. <laughs> I felt like I was actually listening to the podcast rather than recording it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I do like to set an atmosphere. Uh, <laughs> hopefully people... And then I totally broke it. <laughs> Hi! Hi there! Um, Hi! Lilius, can you tell us a little bit about you, please? Um, well, I was born... No. Uh, yeah, I, I now sort of just describe myself as an artist because I feel like the things that I'm doing kind of span over so much now that I can't just say, oh, I'm, I'm a costume designer, oh, I'm an a illustrator, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a drag queen occasionally. Like, it's uh, so just like, you know what, just artist, I do a lot of things, I dabble in a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, you're an amazing Business artist. Lady. Business lady. <laughs> Boss bitch is what I'm going to call Boss you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, like, to be honest, I couldn't really think of anybody I would rather kind of share this podcast with and host with me. So oh. I'm really glad that you're here. <laughs> I feel like you're proposing. <laughs> it's been years. <laughs> Basically, I've been planning this for years, and uh, we're now finally <laughs> Under here. Under the guise of the podcast. <laughs> I know, basically. Um, Lil, I'll, I mean, I'll get you to remind us kind of at the end, but like, where can we find you on social media and stuff like that? Oh, um, so I have three Instagrams. Um, I'm a drag queen called Charlotte Chark. I have uh, costumes for commission, especially for drag queens and burlesque dancers. Um, called Caged Crinoline, uh, mm -hmm. as in like the hoop skirt, Caged underscore Crinoline. And the one where you can find me the most at the moment is my illustration account, which is called Bujo Cult. That's B U J O C U L T. Bujo Cult also has YouTube, where me and Stevie have been doing uh, the Tara Reads podcast, um, which will be up there already. <laughs> all of them are linked to each other, so if you find one of them, you'll find me all the places. <laughs> Exactly, and I guess, yeah, this is the opportunity to plug it plug, plug. <laughs> <laughs> Find my Etsy! <laughs> Get my Etsy! No, but, like, in all seriousness, though, um, you are such an amazing artist, and so you really need to check her out and check out her stuff. If you don't, I'm going to come find you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, bless. Thank you very much. That's fine. Please subscribe. But, um, yeah, so I guess... I <laughs> Sorry. Um, I guess I'll give, you know, a little bit of a context. A context? A little bit of context about myself. So I trained as an anthropologist, and I now work as a drama teacher. Um, and I have to say that storytelling is my passion. Um, growing up, I gravitated towards the spooky and strange, and I'm not gonna lie, at one point around the age of eight, I used to like to tell people that I was a vampire, and uh, I started like a wee vampire covered in my primary school. <laughs> Didn't we all go through that phase? Though? Well, I mean, you know, and um, I was the vampire queen, obviously. Um, so yeah, you know, I was that spooky kid, basically, growing up. And um, later, when I kind of obviously got older, and I... I've come to terms with the fact that I am very, very queer. Um, you know, it kind of dawned on me that the stories I was reading or the films that I was watching, you know, I always identified more with 
the villains or the monsters turn your phone off lady jeez <laughs> i like how i when we were recording mine i was like i'm gonna put on airplane mode ain't nobody disturbing me and then for yours i left it on <laughs> Sorry. obviously there's some prioritizing happening here <laughs> No, but um, anyway, no, but like seriously, like I, growing up, like I always identified more with the villains or the monsters, and I, I think that's because they just seemed a bit more real to me, and I think that's partly because growing up as a queer person, like you are essentially, you know, you're made to feel unnatural, and to be honest, quite frankly, monstrous. So I kind of feel that that identification started my lifelong love and relationship with horror. And essentially birthed this. This is my baby, which I've birthed from my ethereal womb. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so for the next few episodes, we are essentially going to delve, delve into all things haunted. And tonight we're talking about ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> So, boo, bitch. Boo, bitch. So this is going to be um, a mini series which will focus on different kinds of ghosts from diverse cultural perspectives. Uh, this week's uh, episode, we're going to talk about the connection between ghosts and vengeance. Specifically, mm. I know a good bit of Yummy. vengeance. Uh, specifically through the cultural lens of a form of Japanese ghost called the yurei. Um, I'm also going to tell you about a parlour game performed during the Edo period in Japan called Hayaku Monogatari, which roughly translates as a gathering of 100 supernatural tales. Um, and finally tonight, I'm going to read you a ghost story that was submitted to me by the anthropologist James Morris concerning his fieldwork in Taiwan. And um, I am super grateful for James for giving me permission to use um, this material. Uh, for this podcast and bless him he actually wrote this up specifically for me to read so James if you're listening which I hope you are <laughs> um, thank you so much for letting me use this material and also I do apologise I will try my best to pronounce some of the Taiwanese names if I don't please leave me an angry comment and I will <laughs> improve upon <laughs> upon that but yeah I will do my best to pronounce the names as best I can um, and just I guess as a little bit more housekeeping, as a follow-on from next from this week, next week, Lilius and I are actually going to recreate uh, a gathering of 100 Supernatural Tales, but on a much smaller scale. Um, <laughs> but I'll explain... We're busy people. <laughs> we're busy people. We don't, we, we don't have time for 100 stories, but um, I'll explain how that's going to work uh, towards the end of the podcast. Um, and I'm also very happy to say that next week's episode is going to feature a story that was written for the podcast by the wonderful artist Nell Wilson. It's beautiful, and I'm really looking forward to sharing it. And I'm also really hoping that, Lil, we don't accidentally summon something malicious in the process. <laughs> I've actually got my fingers crossed. I'm really hoping. <laughs> I'm here for it. You're, you're here for the ghost drama, I can tell. Um, and I guess, just to clarify, tonight's podcast is going to touch on, I guess, themes of mental health. There is that aspect of some of the things I'm talking about, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there as a kind of like a disclaimer before we begin. But yeah. Yeah, I... if you don't like spooky things, here's probably not the place to be. Yeah, no, it's really probably not. Um, but are you ready, <laughs> Lilius? Are you ready? I am I am fully strapped in, I'm ready for this. You're fully trapped in. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, well, so in the kind of process of me creating this podcast, I put a call out on social media asking people to message me and tell me why they love horror stories. And uh, to be honest, I got some really interesting responses which I'm going to read to you. So for example, I know, oh my, I'll get my reading voice, no. <laughs> this is not my reading voice. Okay, so one person said, it's a total escape from reality. If I'm spooked, I'm not thinking about anything else. Um, another person said, I never used to like horror, but it's something that only appealed to me for the last few years. I think it's partly a way of managing anxiety. I like my scares in a controlled environment, which again, I think is really interesting. And I'm going to touch upon that in a wee bit. Um, and finally, and to be honest, I absolutely loved this. So I'm actually going to quote it in full. Um, this is fantastic. So I'm very particular about my scares. It's mostly the folklore horror genre that fascinates me where there isn't a villain as such, but rather forces of nature that are much bigger than us and in many cases defy logical explanations and ultimately place humans farther down the food chain than we've become used to as a species. 
it's not just the placing me out of my comfort zone that I find scary or fascinating, it's a challenge to our perceived power, whether physical strength or scientific perception, and place in the world as a species that really chills me. Probably because, as 2020 has shown, it's so close to the truth. This kind of horror effectively demonstrates just how fragile our existence as a species is and how arrogant and passive we've allowed technology and capitalism to make us. So this kind of horror is a bit cathartic for me, a bit like seeing a bully get its comeuppance. Also, why slasher horror and psychological horror really doesn't do it for me, I already know how shit people can be. It's not scary, it's irritating, and I want to see humanity collectively punched in the face. <laughs> Who doesn't? That was really interesting. I like that a lot. Wasn't that really interesting? Like, I find that fascinating. So, I mean, to me, what I'm kind of getting from these accounts is that there is a link between horror and people's mental health. And Lilia, so I was kind of wondering, one, what is your kind of personal take on horror? What is your relationship to it? And what do you think about this idea of, like, horror and mental health? Um, I feel like this could be an entire episode in itself where we talk about my history of horror and mental health. Um, mm -hmm. I had a very tumultuous time in my teen years uh, where, uh, to set it up, I was 100% um, the, in inverted commas, not like other girls girl, <laughs> where I desperately <laughs> didn't want to appear to be girly or anything like that. Uh -huh. I didn't want to... Yeah, I was not like other girls. Um, and so I, mean, I really wanted to be into horror. I really wanted to like horror films and not be scared by them and stuff. Um, and around that time, my mental health took a massive dip. Mm -hmm. uh, and my anxiety was really bad. And I was having all sorts of problems with sleep. So I was having sleep paralysis. I was having horrific nightmares. And I was having a uh, phenomena phenomenon <laughs> called um phenomenon the, <laughs> da, da, da. Sorry. i was having one of them um yeah. called uh hypnopompic hallucinations which is when you wake up and you basically continue dreaming the things that i was seeing in these were these horrific characters um mm -hmm. which like, when I start to explain them to people and stuff like that, they're like, yeah, okay, I can understand why you were scared shitless all the time. I was like, yeah, exactly. Um, so that kind of... I, I had quite liked horror. I hadn't been, like, a massive fan of it. I just, I'd quite liked horror, like Silent Hill, horror games, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But around that time is when I completely fell out of love with the genre because that idea of somebody living through this... Um experience where fantasy and reality are so crossed over yeah it became too real for me because i'd been there and i was like you know what the concept of that being real is too much for me it's a horror for me on a totally different level mm -hmm. so i can't enjoy horror films anymore because that that barrier has been crossed for me already and I've, I'm, I'm i'm tapped out i do love though i love a scary story mm -hmm. and i'm in general, like concept wise and stuff, I am more scared of people than I am of horror things. Mm -hmm. Like the idea of summoning something, I'm like, ooh, <laughs> let's. <laughs> I want to see this. But the idea of like somebody breaking into your house or something, that's that's horrific for me. That's that's beyond terrifying. Totally. No, I totally get where you're coming from, from that perspective. I mean, if you've had those experiences where you're feeling like there is this almost meld between reality and, you know, like what your mind is able to produce, I could totally understand why you would be like, oh, okay. <laughs> Gonna step away from that bitch. But, um, <laughs> but like, it's... it's, it's so oh, sorry, I was ahead. very sleep deprived at that time, like I, mm -hmm. because obviously I didn't want to fall asleep because I didn't want to wake up. Um, so I I would force myself into like insomniatic states constantly. Mm -hmm. And you know how your brain's not working great when it's sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that they were hypnopompic hallucinations at the time. I didn't get an answer for it until quite a bit later. So in my head, I was either like, well, I'm either absolutely batshit mental. Like, I'm either, this is it, this is the beginning of the downward spiral, 
and how right I was. No, no but this is I for like the beginning, and this is my life over. Do you know what I mean? I'll spend the rest of my life inside mental institutions. I'm obviously, yeah, far far gone. Or I'm the border in between dimensions, and only I can see what is crossing across, which is also then fed into the batshit crazy. Do you know what I mean? But I like how there was no in between. There was like it's either one extreme or the other extreme, and there's no maybe I just need a good night's sleep. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I've always seen you as some kind of interdimensional witch, but you know. <laughs> I'm same. <laughs> but okay, but that's that's really interesting. Then, kind of what you're saying, almost in contrast to what you know the people who've messaged in have said. You know, because there's almost been this kind of social cathartic element to horror for why they view it and what's interesting is i guess kind of continuing that idea there's a feminist film theorist called isabel pinado who basically talks about this idea of recreational terror and uh i have a quote for you because i do like a good quote but she's <laughs> she says it provides legitimate occasions to overtly express terror and rage feelings that were otherwise forbidden. So essentially, I would kind of see from what she's saying that horror is a space that encapsulates negative or difficult states of emotion and can transform them. I guess similar to the idea of social catharsis in kind of Greek tragedy. That's how I see it as both an anthropologist and a drama person. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting though, because it does remind me of something that um, the drag queen Sharon Needles has said. Obviously Sharon Needles is very influenced by horror as a genre for their drag. Um, and again, so I found an interview with her and she had basically said, growing up in a small Iowa town where there's nothing to do and clearly knowing that I was weird, there was no other salvation than the video or rental store. Horror films to me was the perfect escapism for someone who was bullied or picked on. A lot of horror movies that I loved were pretty much revenge films. The archetype of the victims in 80s horror movies was always the college jock and the popular girl. And I think in order for me not to create another Columbine, I could vicariously live through watching my high school bullies being slaughtered in cinema. Now I know that's a really... That's a bit... <laughs> that's a difficult statement. Do you know what I mean? Mm. There's a lot to unpack there. Like, that is a really difficult statement, especially, obviously, the references to Columbine. Yeah. But I guess what she's almost kind of saying is that, yeah, horror becomes the space and this means through which they kind of process negative emotions in a safe way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do you think about that, Lil? That's... I do find that really interesting because from the horror films I have seen there does seem to be that almost archetype of like in the Scream movies mm -hmm. um, the one who's committing the crimes being the outcast and yeah. being the person who in another movie you could see doing something else or in real life doing something else do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting how that's and I guess it's, it's, it is another I guess what I'm thinking in horror movies, though, is the things that I find scary, which are mm -hmm. things like mass murders and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? That's... Yeah. See, for for me, like, with hearing you talk about, like, horror cathartic release and stuff, I realise now why I watch so many videos about serial killers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, wait, it's because that's the horror for me. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the real life stuff is far more scary for me than the mm -hmm. kind of the more kind of ghosty <laughs> i mean i've to be honest with this podcast i have gathered so much information on like the physiological aspects to horror so i really would like us to, as well to do an episode where we focus on that um mm. but are you ready to learn about some japanese ghosts i am 100 percent ready to learn about japanese ghosts <laughs> i'm here for this me too. <laughs> <laughs> Spill the tea. Spill the tea on the spoops. But yeah, so I guess where we will start is that, you know, in Britain, our spooky season stretches from kind of October all the way through January. I mean, I guess for us, the ultimate winter months tend to be the most active, in inverted mm -hmm. commas, for ghosts according to traditional folk beliefs. So obviously you've got Halloween, which originates with Celtic Samhain, you know, the Festival of the Dead. If you're Catholic, which... My family is very, very lapsed Catholic, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> you've got like All Saints Day and All Souls Day, which is all about the veneration of the dead. And obviously closer to Christmas, you've got this idea of the wild hunt, which is when the dead fly through the skies like geese with like Odin and deities like that, which is really funky. 
Um, and yeah, Christmas ghost stories is such a thing, isn't it? Massively, yeah. So kind of autumn to winter, that's very much our season for this kind of stuff. In Japan, that's totally flipped. So for them, ghosts and hauntings are traditionally seen to be more active in the summer months. And that's because it coincides with their festival of the dead called Obon, which is this Buddhist festival of the dead. And um, that's where the spirits of the dead are supposed to be welcomed by the loved ones and come back home for their kind of annual visit. So that's kind of where hauntings and all that kind of stuff generally happen. Hmm. More spooky stuff. <laughs> that's interesting because I feel... I thought for us it was over autumn and winter because it's the dark months, do you know what I mean? It's the... Mm -hmm. You're sitting inside around a fireplace, so you may as well tell some spooky stories because it's scary and dark outside. I didn't realise right. that it would be such a... It's springtime! <laughs> Time to get the haunting going! <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's all, it does almost come across like, oh, this is some nice weather. I'm going to go haunt some bitches. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's what it sounds like. Um, so I guess something to say then, when you're talking about Japanese yurei, is that in our tradition of spirits, I think you kind of have this wide variety. You've got like your friendly ghosts, you've got like your not so friendly ghosts, you've got some ones in between that don't really interact. Japan's yurei are not friendly. They ain't <laughs> Casper the friendly ghost, all right? That's what they ain't. Um, they are all driven by this kind of uncontrollable, powerful emotion, be that rage, be it sadness, or a thirst for revenge. Understandable. <laughs> <laughs> same. Yeah, same. It's <laughs> what fills um, me in the morning. Right. Coffee rage, and a thirst for revenge. Sadness and a thirst for revenge. <laughs> um, <laughs> the majority of Yurei in Japanese culture are also, interestingly enough, they're mainly women. I mean, men can be depicted as Yurei, but according to traditional narratives, which focus on this idea of, like, theme and can't even speak this focus on this theme of like betrayal and revenge generally it focuses on women because women at the time especially kind of in older japanese folklore occupied a lower rung of the societal ladder so they were more open to abuses from well men, men. often <laughs> fucking men honestly what what dicks <laughs> literally <laughs> but um According to Japanese belief, anyone who dies in the grip of a really powerful emotion, which they call onen, it kind of forms a grudge or an attachment. And this kind of culmination of emotion, it spreads like a contagion, essentially, and it has the power to affect the physical world. And this is what fuels a yure and allows it to manifest in the physical world and hunt the living which is Ooh. super spooky yes yeah. i mean we've i mean we've seen this kind of idea obviously in like j horror films like the grudge the ring you've got obviously kayako sayaki no kayako sayaki in the grudge and sadako in the ring do you know what i mean you've kind of got can that. We... i say i've only seen the american versions of those films i've not seen the original japanese ones because i heard that they were a lot scarier oh they are they're perhaps they're <laughs> fucking terrifying and that's why i love them you know um <laughs> and obviously within these kind of depictions you've got the typical kind of physical kind of depiction of, of a yurei you've got like the long stringy unkept hair mm. you've got like the twisted body and a uh, the white like yurei were to pit that were i can't even speak you know this were typically depicted in white kimonos um, and you see that in like um, sadako in the ring like she's in that kind of white nightgown so the white mm -hmm. is a big symbol as well um, so, the society in which the yurei appeared in kind of feudal Japan, where the kind of image of the yurei was standardized, was not a democracy. They weren't open for, you know, sharing and people basically, yeah, sharing ideas about freedom. And particularly the shogunate government um, was very active in squashing anybody who basically kind of spoke out politically against them, particularly playwrights, because, you know, theatre people as we do we like to, <laughs> we like to talk shit about people and spill tea and uh, <laughs> so i think with playwrights being one of the biggest kind of producers of media in japan at the time um they were monitored very closely so i believe that ghost stories became a means to basically indirectly critique the government and the ruling classes 
That's what I think. I'm I'm 100% behind that in the same way that it happened in the 1700s in London with the... um, I'm getting off topic, continue. (laughs) No, 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 but but you see parallels, right? Yeah, the way that... um, So, yeah, in 17... uh, 1770s-ish in London, there was... Well, in England, there was the um, censorship of uh, plays which is why there became the sudden revival in Punch and Judy and Puppet Plays because they were the one medium that wasn't censored so it was the one way you could still critique the political parties of the time exactly and I think it's the same underground secret puppet shows which is the cutest thing ever (laughs) it's what I've always wanted to be honest (laughs) Um, but yeah so like you see for example in Kabuki um, often they featured narratives which were based around Yurei and it usually depicted women coming back from the grave to punish those who had mistreated them, or say, for example, innocent villagers getting revenge for being killed for sport by the aristocracy. So, oh, interesting. yeah, so there's all these kind of revenge narratives based around people who have been mistreated, basically mm. saying a big fuck you and tearing people's heads off. It's great. Like, <laughs> with this, with do you think part of the uh, purpose of the plays then was to kind of have a bit of revenge in themselves, to mm-hmm. be a bit of a warning of like, oh, you're doing this awful stuff? Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Well, have you heard about what happens to these people you've killed? <laughs> They'll come back and get you. <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, I think it's a very indirect way of also stating, like, for example, women's power, right? Mm. You can treat me this way, but I'm gonna fucking get you. So, like, for example, actresses, or, well, actresses, because there were no actresses in Kabuki plays, because they were all played by men. Yeah. Actors who um, would have to depict um, the yurei in the plays would often go to the gravesite of um, the women who the plays often depicted to propitiate the spirit, to basically be like, look, hey girl, I'm gonna play you, please don't kill me. Because quite often there were lots of um, supernatural so-called accidents surrounding actors who Mm -hmm. performed in these roles so the idea being was you would propitiate the spirit before you would play the role and so i think again the play that it's all this kind of indirect way of being like treat your women well because you know they can come back and they can kill you do you know what i mean i think there is this element yeah i mean you'd like you'd like people to treat each other well just because they're fellow humans but if all else fails do you know what i mean <laughs> trying to haunt them forever is also good <laughs> i mean yeah <laughs> no totally but like and that's the thing i think when you're looking at that kind of society where i guess equality wasn't really a thing it's just an interest i think it's it always it's like an interesting social byproduct do you know what i mean of this mm-hmm. kind of attitude but yeah so i think this this kind of environment essentially spawned as well the Hayaku Monogatari, which is the 100 stories, or also called the 100 Candles, which uh, was a parlour game played during the summer months, particularly. And how you played, and I actually have the rules here, which I'm quite excited oh. about. <laughs> which we're going to follow, by the way, as much as we can. <laughs> oh yes, okay. So the basic idea would be that you would um, gather a group of say three or more obviously it would just be you and me so we're just gonna have to focus on we're gonna have to deal with that um you would gather on the night of the full moon which halloween will be when we air the episode which i'm super excited and uh you would assemble at someone's home and you will prepare two rooms okay well so... i mean we're in two rooms but they're just not in the same house <laughs> <laughs> god's sake social COVID. distancing version <laughs> so... <laughs> that's what we're gonna call it um the idea being that you will darken one of the rooms but in that room you will have lit 100 candles okay and you will place in the center of the room a table and a mirror um participants who are going to take place in this game have to wear some form of blue and they're not allowed to carry any weapons so you're going to have to take that switchblade out of your boot okay because i know you carry it i i have a question yes I will miss my switchblade. B, (laughs) what happens if I summon something and I require that switchblade? And C, I only own black. (laughs) I think we're just going to have to just make do. (laughs) It's very dark blue, okay? It's very dark blue. Um, And so the idea being that after each tale is told, the person who tells the story must go through to the other room and extinguish one of the candles. Um... And so obviously the room will get darker and darker and darker 
And then this is the only time as well that a participant is allowed to actually move about the space freely. They've got to stay in the storytelling room unless they're moving to extinguish a candle, okay? So they've got to be in that fixed space. Um, the idea being that as the room gets darker and darker and darker, and as the final candle is extinguished, something supernatural is supposed to happen. Um, and it's never stated specifically what that is. I'm assuming it's got something to do with the mirror, because I think you must kind of, you know, as you're kind of extinguishing the candle, you're supposed to look in the mirror. So I'm assuming that you're supposed to see something within the mirror once they're all extinguished. But um, according to like How, traditional rules... Question, question, see me question. Yes. How do you see anything in anything with all the candles extinguished? I don't know, that's a really good point. <laughs> Just get your lighter and be like, whoop. <laughs> Hello? Maybe this is why they do it in spring, so that there's still some light. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, I mean, I just, I find this idea fascinating. One, obviously, as, like, a form of entertainment, but also because it totally reminds me, because I'm a giant nerd, of, like, <laughs> tabletop role-playing games. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're all gathered together. Yes! You're all telling spooky stories, and there's actually a game <laughs> called Ten Candles, where you, um... You extinguish a candle every time, like, a part of your character's story reaches its, like, like, like its culmination and you burn parts of your character sheet and it's all, I don't know, it just reminds me of that. And so... Yeah, a lot. Yeah, I don't know, it just, it just basically reminds me of a big game of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> Spooky Dungeons and Dragons. Spooky! But, um, yeah, so kind of what, like... What I feel about this is that it's another medium in which obviously people can let off steam, but they can also subvert the status quo because you can tell whatever spooky tale you want. You have a captive audience in the sense that they can't freely move around. And if you think about it, the impact of whatever story you're going to tell is going to be so much more heightened because people are afraid, right? So there's that almost didactic element to it of kind of getting a really getting a point across and claiming your narrative and claiming your space. So I just thought that was really cool. <laughs> that is really cool. I like that. So, I'm excited to do it now. I know, I'm excited. So I think what we'll do is um, we will light 10 candles. What I, what, I, what I will do is that people have actually sent me through um, ghost story submissions. And I think what we'll do is I have 10, I have 10 stories in total. I'll give you five. I'll take five. And then we'll read them and we'll extinguish a candle one by one. And, you know, I don't know, maybe something supernatural will happen at the end of it. I love that so much. I'm excited. I'm going to film some of it for my vlogs as well. Yes, so. I think that will be really, really good. <laughs> Just in case, do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, oh, no. you know, get it on film. Um, but yeah, like, are you ready to hear a ghost story? I am so ready to hear a ghost story. Okay, cool. So, I'm going to read us now the story um, that was submitted by James. So, um, I guess just to give a bit of background, James is an anthropologist who's doing his fieldwork in Taiwan, um, studying the traditional and contemporary Taiwanese beliefs surrounding shrines and tombs. So, um, he submitted this to me, and I really like it, so I'm going to read it, and we're just going to see what you think. I'm looking forward to getting your response. <laughs> okay, so. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, let's go. Before moving to Taiwan, I'd assumed my concept of life and death had essentially solidified. When I was younger, I had buoyed belief in the afterlife, having regularly gone through the deaths of close family members since I was 10 years old, and hearing the family ghost stories which seemed to leak in the months after each one. After college, I was more convinced of a materialist, reductivist point of view. When you die, you just stop being. The same as before you were born, no you to care about your non-existence. After all, with death, there's no more you to exist, so when you're gone, you're gone. Maybe there's an afterlife, maybe there's a creator, but you can't measure it. So it's just as well to put those ideas out of your head. A friend in high school told me the Japanese believe ghosts could kill you. Later, I came to understand the logic of this through Taiwan's culture. Outside of Taipei, which is a culture of its own, nobody on the island whistles at night because they believe it can attract ghosts. Superstitions were stronger in the south and on the islands. 
These ghosts won't kill you, per se, but can make you sick enough that you die, and often do so because they want some company. At the very least, they would cause you bad luck if you caught their attention. For me, the young, materialist, reductivist, it was just superstition. While I enjoyed a good ghost story, these beliefs were unfounded. After all, any afterlife would have, would have to follow a universal framework, right? The rules of death must apply equally to all cultures regardless of beliefs. Like gravity or electromagnetism, spirits in the afterlife would have to follow universal laws which determined how the afterlife and the spirit world worked. Already I was finding the idea of ghosts being able to maim, kill and cause misfortune unsuitable. Ghosts didn't do this in the West after all. If the afterlife worked differently in Asia than it did in the West, then it was apparent to me that at least one of these concepts was the work of pure superstition. Moreover, I assumed that both beliefs were superstitions that when I die I'd follow whatever universal laws worm food followed. Ghosts and the dead feature prominently in Taiwanese culture. Here the term the dead takes on a demographic notion, like the troops of ethereal fairy commonwealths in Celtic tradition. The deceased are treated as if they are very much still in existence. Death is a modality change, it's just another phase in one's existence. Incorporeal, but the body has been traded in for cosmic influence, interceding and bringing forth fortune, but also capable of calling down and inflicting misfortune. Fanciful, somewhat reassuring, but not very provable. Shortly after my, my first field trip to the Pengu Islands, I still needed to complete my term project for Dr. Blundell's course on Taiwan's society and culture. I would settle on a video about the heritage value and threatened status of cemeteries, tombs and burial spaces in Taiwan, expanding from my initial interest in the Chang tomb at my university. To accomplish this, I began to scout other locations nearby in my corner of Taipei. I would ride a bicycle along the streets, the roads running from Li Zhang Li through the massive Fuda Cemetery, a complex of tens of thousands of tombs built in the hillsides on the southern flanks of the Elephant and Tiger Mountains Ridge. I also hiked up Mao Kong, the touristy tea plantation village in the mountains above my university. On previous trips to Mao Kong, I'd seen a collection of tombs cram the street and using Google Maps, I found a much more sizable cemetery tucked deep in the mountains that I wanted to visit. Carrying the Battle War Nikon cameras, both the digital SLR and the GPS capable Coolpix model, I hiked up the trail and walked along the roads of Mao Kong, stopping here and there to collect pictures of the odd tomb along the roadway, and record video as I made my way to the cemetery. On one occasion, I'd climbed over a barrier and was balancing myself on a steep slope down below the roadway. I heard an accent shout down to me, bad idea mate. I looked up to see an Asian family passing by. I shouted back, oh no worries, I'm, I'm doing research, or something to that effect. Climbing back up onto the road. Farther along, I saw some locals clearing some planting space on a hillside. Nestled among the space was another tomb. I asked the people working there if they'd be okay if I took some pictures of the tomb. They smiled and welcomed me taking the photo as I continued on. I arrived at the pathway which would lead me to the cemetery. Walking up the path, I was met by a black dog who ran out from around a building to bark furiously at me. Taiwan has many roving dogs who make the marginalised spaces their haunts. I had run into a similar problem. A pack of more than 10 dogs had once challenged me when I was walking at night, but eventually determined I wasn't a threat and after a few tense moments let me pass. I would wait until it decided I wasn't a threat. Five minutes, ten minutes, an eternity passed by. The dog kept barking like mad at me. Two women who worked for the nearby tourism promotion centre indicated they thought the path was a private walkway, though the city had very clearly marked it as a city lane. I decided to see if there was another entrance without a barking dog. I did find a staircase elsewhere leading up the mountain, but this was so overgrown that I was worried about venomous snakes or wasps nests or other unforeseen problems arising. I walked back to the original path and finding the dog had disappeared, carried on. During this hike, I dismissed several omens. Now the most recent omen had decided I wasn't worth barking at and might as well let me get my dumb self into trouble. For my part, I was happy the dog had determined I wasn't worth barking at. It was past noon and the afternoon thunderstorms were threatening to gather. 
From 2 to 4 p.m., like clockwork, the clouds would roll in and hit Wenshan District hard with a two-hour light and sound show. As amazing as it is, it's an experience I prefer to observe at a distance. The way the thunder echoes throughout the veils, the ground trembles, the air hits you and it sounds as though like heavy steel cables to some massive bridge in the clouds are snapping and whipping under incredible strain. There were distant rumbles somewhere already and the sky had become cloudy. The air was heavy and damp. I'd give myself 30 minutes to collect as much data as possible, photographs only. The pathway was paved with rough cut stones, but these were somewhat slippery, either covered by mud that had settled where rivulets from previous rains had washed down from the slopes above, or from the ever-present moisture in the air, made worse by the grasses growing up over them. The trail took me up behind the tea plantations. To my left, the hill rose. To my right, it dropped, sometimes dangerously slow. The path was crossing into the face of the slope, and soon the tombstones came into sight above the trail. It was a research boon, a variety of styles and eras, Qing Dynasty craftsmanship, Japanese-style columns, Christian and folk Taoism, mainland revolts and local burial pods. With the sky getting darker and the ground becoming more damp, I'll admit the space had a somewhat eerie quality to it, and something deep inside of me felt more at ease with the tombs bearing a cross. Knowing it was a silly notion, I shrugged it off and continued on. It was still well before two in the afternoon though, and I was set to work bowing before each tombstone to show respect, taking a photograph of the tomb, tombstone and anything of note, before moving on to the next, doing the same, and moving on. In this way, I would assume I covered approximately 40 tombs on the high slope before the terrain made it impossible to climb higher or move laterally. I clambered back down to the path and continued pressing deeper into the jungle. At some point, I decided it would be better just to collect data from the path, only photographing the tombs which were right there and available rather than climbing up the hillside to take more photos. The storm would likely be coming soon, and I didn't want to get caught in it. I'd see how far into the mountains the path went. I could always return to take more photos at another date. Farther in, the jungle was reclaiming its territory. Reviewing my photos, the entire ambiance was becoming gloomier, and the flash on the camera kept automatically turning on. The path was more or less overgrown with grass, and certainly not well maintained at this point. I was about to turn back, but then ahead of me I spied something incredibly unique. Two rows of uniform tombstones, one above the other, running parallel above the pathway. Each row contains more than 15 tombstones, each set into an interlinked but a, by a small concrete retaining wall, what I, could, what I would come to call a chain of tomb arrangements. The only other place I had seen this was at Pengu's old tombs, but even then they were regular shaped stones, and no more than four in a chain. These stones were no different. They didn't have as much writing on them. Whatever was written on them will appear to be standardised. Knowing this was a unique find, I set about documenting them. I would not return for two years. I did not want to return. The merry little jingle of the cool picks greeted me hello as it turned on and extended the mechanical lens. I photographed the first few without a problem, but got to, the to tombstone number 5 or 6 and the screen went black. Odd, though not unexpected. Some of the batteries I was using weren't the best and the camera itself had sustained many unknown beatings from years of field use by other researchers. It had done this before in Pengu. No big deal. Looking at the black screen, something seemed off. The lens was still extended. Weird. Usually the camera would give me an alarm and display that the battery was out of energy and I needed to replace it. I had my other camera slung across my side, so pulling it out I went back to work. I was able to photograph that stone no problem. I sidestepped and crouched down to the next. I pressed the shutter button halfway to activate the automatic focus, but it couldn't lock onto the stone. I adjusted the focal length and tried again. The mechanism within the lens was whirring, then stopped, but hadn't focused. It wasn't working. I popped the lens cap back on and put both cameras into my backpack. The cameras were telling me it was time to go home. I'd hoped to finish with the remaining stones in the row, but decided that I didn't want to fight with my cameras. The distant thunder was getting closer anyway. I stood up to sling my backpack over my shoulders and noticed the air felt much cooler than it had been only moments before. Something dawned on me as the hair on the back of my neck stood on end, spreading up the base of my skull to the top of my head. 
Evolution has given us an amazing ability to recognise dangers before they are clear to our rational brain. If there is a rope or a garden hose in your field of vision before you even realise what you're looking at, the fight or flight response kicks in, believing it's a snake. If you've ever been in a car accident, you may experience a moment of time dilation. Experiencing a brief moment where you realise what is coming, but it happens in slow motion. Your brain has enough time to process a thought, something between a string of expletives acting as surrogates for incredulity, and damn it, this is going to be inconvenient. I was not in a car, nor were there any snakes, but I'd seen plenty of ghost hunting shows and read more than my fair share of ghost stories as a kid to recognise what was happening next. The cemetery, the overly protective dog, thunderstorm, electronics drained a battery, cold air. No, I told myself, when you're dead, you're dead. I refused to believe this was happening while I was alone in the mountains. Had I, I had done everything by the book. I, I had bowed, hadn't I? Oh. Thinking back in my excitement, I'd forgotten to bow. I remember turning around to walk out of the cemetery. I remember telling myself I'd walk at a normal pace, not feed into superstition. I remember a pressure on my back. Something between a push and a feeling of a growing bubble of energy consolidating behind me, expanding and pushing me out of the space. I remember a wave of sorrow washing over me, replaced by a wave of primal fear. I do not remember how I took off running. I remember yelling out. I remember that somehow I was running faster than I should have. I remember thinking if I slip I'm going to get really hurt. I remember crashing into a fence. I bet I looked really cool. I got to the bottom of the path, to the road, where the two women were standing. I was out of breath. There's a ghost in there, I said. I looked back and saw the dog come out from around the corner, standing in the pathway, looking at me. Its posture and expression were easy to read. I told you not to go in there, you dumbass. Good dog. No. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, no, I, I really, really liked that as well. Um, spooky dookie. And again, I've got to really thank James for handing that in, you know, for me yeah. to use for this. Um, it's interesting, you know, this idea of respect and if you don't give proper respect, then you're going to essentially suffer for it, you know, as you see in that story. Mm. It's almost like you can see in these ghost stories that if you somehow break some kind of societal code or social, you know, mm. idea, then, you know, you're going to get haunted. So... <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I did. I really liked it. I really appreciated James um, handing that in to us. So I think you can almost conclude that, you know, there's a subversive element to horror. It's a space to critique and subvert societal norms and, I guess, kind of get your voice heard. Yeah. So, so yeah. Any any closing thoughts on that, Lil? I actually kind of want to go and watch a horror film now. <laughs> 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 it's the first time in years I've actually been like, I could totally watch a horror film. Well, I feel like we've done our job. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the case. Um, cool. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll wrap it up here. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for joining me uh, tonight. Next week, obviously, we will enact our mini version of our Night of 100 Tales. And um, yeah... Just thank you very much for listening in. Um, Lilius, do you want to just remind us again, what's your Instagram handle if you want to find uh, you? Best place to find me is at Cult B-U-J-O-C-U-L-T on Instagram, uh, YouTube. I'm on TikTok as well, like a cool chat. Don't go on my TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrifically embarrassing. Uh, yeah, YouTube and Instagram for me. Lovely. And uh, if you want to find me, I am at Restless House. Um, restless as in you're feeling restless and then house spelt the German spelling so H-A-U-S so yeah you can find me on Instagram as well I am planning on actually creating like a proper Widdershins Yarn uh, podcast Instagram so you know keep an, keep an eye out for that um, and yeah tune in next week on Halloween when we read some more spooky tales and do a little bit of a ritual thank you very much <laughs> Bye for now.